This is wonderful Patrick Regan, who has given hope to many people, including mm -hmm. myself. Just going to pray for him now. Lord, I pray for you for this scintillating young man <laughs> uh, <laughs> who, who you, is going <laughs> to share with us today. Lord, thank you for the way you fill his words with grace and hope. Uh, fill him with your Holy Spirit, Lord, that he can share your compassionate heart with us today. Amen. 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 Thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I've been introduced lots of times in lots of different contexts, but I have to say that's the first time I've been told that I'm um, a boring old man. So um, that's um, I'm never going to let that go now. I think that's going to be... Um, I think I need to put that on my bio, actually. Um, but that's brilliant. And uh, so it's really, really lovely to be here with you. Oh, it's very weird seeing a picture of yourself looking back. And uh, oh, hi, hi, everyone. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's lovely. It's really, really nice. I, I love coming to churches like this. Again, I get the privilege of speaking in different churches, different sizes. And, uh, and people are always like, what's your favourite type of church to speak in? You know, and... Uh, and I always say the same. I think it's the ones that feel really authentic. Um, I, they're, they're the ones I like. Um, I, I've spoken in churches, there's thousands of spoken in churches that are tiny. But I love the ones where people just feel really real and, uh, and very comfortable with each other as well. So thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I really do appreciate it. And, uh, and I hope I'm just going to be a blessing to you guys. I want to be real and honest. I hope that's okay. Is that okay with you guys? Um, and it's interesting being in a school. I don't know if you remember your school assembly. I don't know if you remember your school assembly as being the most riveting, exciting, dynamic moment of your school career. Just put your hand up if your school assembly was like that. Oh, wow. That, that's the biggest response I've ever had. Like the school assemblies around here must be incredible. Are you all teachers by any chance? Uh, and, uh, um, but my favourite story of a school assembly is of um, a group of students. They came in and, uh, and on the stage was a table. And on the table was a basket of uh, apples, juicy looking apples. But the teachers had written a sign above the apples and it basically said this. Take one apple only. God is watching. <laughs> And uh, the kids looked a bit nervous, you know, and uh, so they marched past the um, stage, they took a table, they sat down, they looked around and, uh, and started to eat. The assembly finished and they went out the back door. And as they went out the back door, there was another table. And on this table, there was some delicious homemade chocolate brownie. And, uh, and a kid had written a big sign that went above the chocolate brownie, which said this, take as much brownie as you want, God's watching the apples. <laughs> and sometimes I feel like we do communicate a God that in society that couldn't possibly understand what we're at. Um, that's just full of loads of rules that couldn't understand our anxiety or our challenges or, or life hits you hard at sometimes, doesn't it? And, uh, and that's not the God that I believe in. And, uh, but um, I'm here with Natasha. Natasha is actually uh, my PA and my goddaughter. So um, she gets a double whammy. And, uh, and it's absolutely brilliant. And we've got some resources at the back. And I wanted just to draw your attention to a couple. Um, one is, um, I don't know if you guys have come across the Kintsugi art. Um, I have a friend who's an artist. And we rarely have these available, actually, because she makes these beautiful Kintsugi um, pendants. Every single one is handmade, is handcrafted, is bespoke. And, uh, and they're just so beautiful and uh, obviously individually made. And, uh, and like I say, we don't often have them available because they just sell out so quickly because it's quite hard to buy something that's bespoke, isn't it, these days? Everything's very manufactured and they're just incredible, uh, different colours as well. And then also this is my new book, Brighter Days, um, 12 Steps to Strengthen Your Wellbeing. Um, I wrote this because I was sitting in my office one day and I was looking at all my hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books lots of theology books and all sorts of things. And I thought, you know what? I don't have one book that I would give to a non-Christian. And because uh, all my books argue about theology and argue about this and argue about that. And I'm not saying that's not important. I've written some because I think theology is really important. But I wanted to write something that I could give someone in a doctor's surgery or in Costa Coffee or um, to my family who aren't Christians, um, who may be struggling a little bit. And then I wrote it in a style 
that is really different to any other book I wrote. Because when I was struggling and people kept on giving me books, they're normally big, thick textbooks like that. And I was like, there's no chance I'm going to read that. Um, so I wrote it in short stories and poems and little quotes and illustrations that have really helped me uh, improve my mental health and well-being. And uh, so if you know someone who's struggling, please get them a copy. I'm happy to sign it for them. Um, and uh, there's special deals there as well. If you can't afford it and you need it, come and talk to me. Um, I didn't write books to make profit. I want to promote them because I want to make a difference. Um, and uh, But I'd really uh, recommend you get it for someone else um, and one for yourself if you want it as well. Now, um, who remembers the game Tetris? Anyone remember the game Tetris? I sort of feel like sometimes life can feel like a bit like a game of Tetris. <laughs> um, things always seem to go wrong at once. And what happens with this computer game is these blocks, they fall out of the sky. And the idea is, is you're meant to try and get them in a straight line. And if you get them in a straight line, the line disappears, but the blocks go quicker and quicker and quicker. And eventually it's just game over. And life can feel, is, does that happen to anyone else? That everyone seems to, everything seems to go wrong at once. In fact, this next slide probably describes my life. Can you put your hand up if you can relate to that at all? Is there anyone here? Um, thank goodness there's a few people that can relate to that. And uh, we have our plan, but then suddenly life doesn't always work out the way we think it's going to. And I want to share with you this morning the story of Elijah, because I think Elijah is this fascinating story of ups and downs. Um, Elijah lived in Galilee and uh, Galed, and he was wandering around one day and probably praying because the situation, the culture that he was um, born into was pretty severe. There was an, uh, an evil king uh, and queen called Ahab and Jezebel. And Jezebel was fascinated with the occult. So she used to erect temples and, and she was driven. She was unpredictable. She was ruthless. And she used to basically erect these temples to a god called Baal, who they believed was in charge of the weather. Now, that's important because people made their um, living by agriculture. So it was important to give the, you know, to keep the god of the weather happy. And uh, but it was awful. You know, they used to sacrifice children. They used to um, do the most wicked occult things. And I think one day Elijah was wandering around, probably praying about this situation. And then he had that realization, which occasionally happens to me as well, that God is calling you to be the answer to your own prayers. <laughs> and so he confronts Ahab and Jezebel. <clears throat> and he says um, in 1 Kings 17, verse 1, he says, um, there will be no more rain nor dew until I say so. Now, who's in charge? Who's meant to be in charge of the weather? Oh, so this is a big deal. This is a big insult. And then from there, poor Elijah goes off and he has to hang out for a year at a place called the Cherith Ravine. Now, when I imagined uh, Elijah at the Cherub Ravine when I was at Sunday school, I, you know, I coloured in Elijah at the Cherub Ravine and uh, it was hot. It was nice. He was sunbathing. Um, and you know the story that actually um, ravens used to um, give him meat um, twice a day and God provided for him. But the reality is the Cherub Ravine would have been a murky, um, <coughs> algae infested pool. Um, ravens, which were known as an unclean bird, were dropping him raw meat twice a day, and he didn't have any human company for a year. It was 120 degrees. So this wasn't a great experience. And after him being there for a year, the, and God said to him, I want you to go to a place called Xenopath. Now, Xenopath was Jezebel's hometown. So it was full of Baal worshippers. And it was about 18 miles away from the Cherub of Eden. So I can imagine Elijah getting there thinking, I haven't had any human company for a year. I'm starving. Um, and he meets this widow who basically says, I'm collecting sticks um, because um, I'm going to make a cake and then we're gonna, I'm going to die. She's suicidal. And, uh, you know, and Elijah um, gets to know her. You know, there's a massive miracle where, where uh, the, the, the oil and the, and the food doesn't run dry for a year, for well over a year probably. And, uh, and then the sun dies, Elijah gets to blame. 
And then it all climaxes in a place called Carmel. And at Carmel, that's the place where, uh, I won't go into it in too much detail, but basically that's the place where Elijah, with God's help, defeated the prophets of Baal. And, uh, and at that point, I think Elijah probably thought, this is the climax. This is it. I've defeated the prophets of Baal. I'm going to go on a book tour. <laughs> I'm going to go on speaking engagement after everyone's going to want to hear my story. But actually, this is what happens. 1 Kings 19, 1 to 5, it says this. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, and he, he killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a message to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if this time by tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. Elijah was afraid, and he ran for his life. He went to Bathsheba in Judah, where he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a boom bush. He sat down under it and prayed that he may die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Elijah ended up into a very, very dark place, a place where he should have been celebrating, but actually he became suicidal. And he wanted God just to take away his life. Because you know what? Life doesn't always work out the way we think it's going to do. Redundancies are made. Um, test results sometimes come back with terrifying news. Marriages do break down. And, uh, and it's not the way we wanted it to be, but it is reality for a lot of people. And Elijah was in that place. And I guess for me, I've experienced a little bit of what it's like when life doesn't always work out the way you think it is. You know, I've had one of those, uh, I think in my life, I've had many seasons where I've been working so hard and uh, I've just been on the edge of burnout all the time. You know, I always say to people that if I take my phone and I charge this um, and it's on 100%, it's pretty good, it works. But my phone works as well on 100% as it does 10%. It just doesn't last very long. And I think what a lot of us do is we get tired and we get exhausted and we think, oh, I need to rest a little bit, you know. So we put the phone in and it's on 10% and then we go again. And actually, um, you can live life like that for quite a while, but it's not sustainable long term. Yet many of us live ourselves in that situation where we are literally given out of a really difficult place. And what I struggled with was my, my Facebook post, my show reel, the, the, the person I was portraying to the outside looked pretty good. You know, um, we had visits from the royal family. There's some pictures here. Um, there's a picture there of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. Now, now obviously, the Prince and Princess of Wales. And uh, there's a picture there of my wife there. My wife's the one in the black, in case you're wondering. <laughs> and um, it was quite funny, actually. Just before this photograph was taken, um, Catherine turned to Diane, my wife, and went, do you like my dress? <laughs> and uh, I'm not really sure what you meant to say when the Princess of Wales says, do you like my dress? You can't really go, no, it's horrible. <laughs> um, so um, she went, it's a really lovely dress, your Royal Highness. <laughs> and, uh, and she went, oh, that's good. Because William says, I look like a tablecloth. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, now you come to mention it. No, I didn't say that. And, uh, but, you know, these photos that you're seeing literally went around the world. Um, OK Magazine, Hello Magazine. Um, I got an award at an OBE from Her Majesty the Queen. And uh, I'm speaking at conferences. I don't know if you can see the little guy in the background there is Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Um, sitting next to Mary Robinson, who was the former president of Ireland. And, you know, these, like I said, these photos went around the world. But the reality is, in these photos, I'm struggling and I'm not telling anyone about it. I'm like Elijah. I'm like, I just can't do this anymore. And I was struggling with anxiety and, and uh, I was going through some really traumatic things in my life. And I had a lot of health issues. My kids had a lot of health issues. My dad had health issues. And, and I think when you go through traumatic events, it acts like rocket fuel to your anxiety, doesn't it? And so I told people in church that I was struggling with anxiety and they were like, ah, have you prayed enough? And I was like, I am praying as much as I flipping can. They were like, well, maybe there's some hidden sin that, um, that you haven't 
confessed. So I confessed every sin that I could think of. In fact, I made some up just to be sure. <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and, and I just felt broken. I just felt broken. I think, and I came to the place, and I've been around church for a long time. I've spoken in long places. And the reason I enjoy it here so much is I'm a little bit fed up with the show, to be honest. I'm a little bit fed up with pretending everything's okay when it's not. I'm desperate for authenticity and reality and honesty. I want to talk about real issues. You know, Elijah was suicidal. Um, suicide kills more men than any other thing. More young, more, kills more young men than, than, uh, than cancer. It's incredible. Um, every single day, people are reaching that point. 18 people uh, take their lives every single day. 6,000 people a year. And as guys, we don't really talk about our mental health because we believe some rubbish that says we need to man up all the time and uh, keep our emotions under wrap. And yet, for many of us, we think about our physical health all the time. We think, you know, I need to be careful what I eat. Maybe I need to go to the gym. Maybe I need to walk more. But we don't think about our mental health in exactly the same way. And the challenge is, a bit like physical health and mental health and spiritual health, should I say, is there's a difference between mental health and mental illness. Just in exactly the same way, there's a difference between physical health and physical illness. And yet what we do is we just put it all together and, uh, and don't really understand it, if we're honest. So when I was writing um, this book, I wanted to try and understand what anxiety felt like for lots of people. And, uh, and I sort of had all the textbook stuff, you know, that when we're in trauma or when we're, when we're in a difficult situation, our body goes into fight, flight, or freeze. Um, I totally get that, but I thought I just wanted it to be a bit more, less clinical. And uh, so I found these messages and uh, where people describe what anxiety feels like, and I thought they were fascinating. It says this, anxiety is your brain not being able to turn off. <laughs> it's the unanswered text message that kills us inside, especially WhatsApp, because you can tell it's been read, right? <laughs> the message. it believes every negative scenario that you come up with it's the inaccurate conclusions drawn as your mind takes off and you have no choice to follow its lead it's apologizing for things that don't require you to say sorry anyone ever do that i'm so sorry what are you so sorry for it's not your fault well, I'm not, i know but i'm, I'm sorry <laughs> it's self-doubt and a lack of confidence it's trying to fix something that isn't a problem it's the fear of failure and striving for perfection and beating yourself up when you don't get there. It tells you you're wrong. They don't like you. It's constantly asking the what if questions. And it was interesting. As I started to grapple with anxiety and uh, uh, I was trying to find a definition, which I thought was a little bit kinder than some of the definitions I've read in the past, because my experience of anxiety was that people that struggle with anxiety are often caring, sensitive, kind, show incredible empathy to other people. And, uh, but it's a little bit like a car alarm. If it's going off all the time, really annoying. Annoying for you, annoying for everyone else. But actually it has a function. And, uh, and I came across this definition and I, I just think this definition is beautiful. So I wrote it in here. It's from a, a lady called Kirsty Cooley who often says, anxiety is the most caring person in the room. Um, she says this, more than anything else, anxiety is caring. It's never wanting to hurt someone's feelings. It's never wanting to do something wrong. More than anything, it's the want and the need to be accepted and liked. So you try too hard sometimes. You try too hard sometimes. And that makes complete sense to me. I was doing a talk uh, similar to this, and someone um, sent me these uh, cartoons, which I quite like. Um, this is Anxiety. <laughs> What if nobody likes me? What if I taste weird? What if I'm too cold? What if I'm too hot? What if I'm just right and I can never live up to it again? <laughs> well, we overthink, don't we? We start asking ourselves all these different questions as we start to think about our mental and emotional health, as we start to think how do other people perceive us. And, uh, and so what I want to do is I want to look just really briefly, because I know time will fly by, is just at what are the lessons we can learn through how God treated Elijah in this situation? Because um, Elijah's in a pretty, pretty desperate place. And uh, so 1 Kings uh, uh, 15, uh, 19, verse 5 to 9, it says this. 
And then he lay down under the bush and he fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched at him and said, cheer up, mate, it ain't that bad. Oh, no, it doesn't say that. Sorry, wrong, wrong version. Um, at once, the angel touched him and said, a lot, a lot of people have it a lot harder than you, you know. <laughs> um, all at once, the angel touched him and said, if you just exercise more, you'll be fine. At once, the angel touched him and said, you just need to pray more and read your Bible and uh, let God forgive your sins. At once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back to him a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey has been too much for you. So he got up and he ate and he drank. Strengthened by that food, he travelled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. Then he went into a cave and he spent the night there. The Lord appeared to Elijah. I love this because you know what? Elijah's crushed by disappointment. There's no pep talk. There's no cheer up, mate. There's no remember the good old days, get it all in perspective and let's talk about old victories. Um, he just ministers compassion. He says, you're tired sleep you're hungry eat you know sometimes it's good to be practical about life and uh, and that's where god was and i love that you know mike yaconelli um says this and i think this is so true most of us don't come home at night staggering drunk instead we come home staggering tired worn out exhausted and drained because we live too fast that what god was doing he was showing elijah uh, some compassion and, uh, and the thing I love about compassion is that compassion is a verb. It's an action word. Self-compassion is what we need to try and show ourselves at times. I remember going to see to therapy once and uh, I got a Christian um, therapist. She's brilliant. And she says to me, Patrick, what does um, self-compassion look like to you? And I was like, to be honest, I'm a bloke. I don't do baths and I don't do candles. So I think what you're talking is rubbish. I'm an activist. I want to change the world. And she just looked at me like, you've totally misunderstood what this is. And I was like, well, what do you mean? And uh, she said this, that true self-compassion is talking to yourself the way that you would talk to your best friend. Who's your biggest critic? You, right? You will beat yourself up like you will not beat anyone else up. Well, I hope so. <laughs> Don't want you go beating up these people. But, you know, it's true, isn't it? Our inner critic, there's nowhere where it won't go. And again, in brighter days, I talk about different types of inner critic that come at us. But how would you treat a friend who's struggling? I bet you, you treat them with sympathy and kindness and patience and encouragement. Compassion means to suffer with, to be conscious of another's distress and have that desire to alleviate that pain. So self-compassion is doing that for yourself. Self-compassion isn't about taking the easy way out. It's about offering ourselves kindness so we can offer kindness to others. When you get on the plane and they give you that little instruction before you take off, what's the first thing they say to you? Is put your own oxygen mask on first. And it feels wrong because they say, even before you care for your kids, put your own oxygen mask on first. Um, so if you do that, you're going to be more used to the people around you. The second key thing about <clears throat> um, this story of Elijah is Elijah is convinced that he is the only prophet left. So he says in 1 Kings 19 verse 10, he says this, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars and put your prophets to death with a sword. I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me. You see, Elijah was overwhelmed. He was lonely. And yet, if you read on in the passage, in 1 Kings 19, verse 18, there were 7,000 other prophets left hiding in caves. Obadiah, who was 007, um, was basically hiding um, the prophets of God in places. Um, but Elijah didn't know. He thought he was the only one left. And who knows that loneliness makes any issue bigger? That's why we have to talk about this stuff in church. That's why we have to be a community that grapples with this stuff. Some of the stats around loneliness are incredible. Being acutely lonely is as stressful as being punched in the face by a stranger and massively increases your risk of depression. The effects of loneliness is the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. 
three quarters of GPs see between one and five lonely people a day. And so we've got to do this stuff together. Um, you may, have, I know some of you have been on the Kintsugi Hope course, but basically um, it was probably well, eight months before COVID hit. Me and my wife died. We were like, you know what? I feel like God's calling us to maybe um, start a bit of a movement. And, uh, and I was like, what does movements mean? So I studied movements for a little bit of time. So I looked at things like park run. Anyone here done park run? Wow, there's a few. Fit. Wow, that's really impressive. So park run for some of you, because only four of you have done it. Um, so park run for the rest of you is where hundreds of thousands of people run in parks across our country. Um, what I love about it is different cultures, different ages, different abilities. You belong, but you don't have to fit in. Quite like that. I love that fact. Um, there's something called rock choir. Rock choir runs on exactly the same principle. Different cultures, different ages. They start choirs in community centres and schools and, and churches. And then they come together at Wembley Arena. You can watch it on YouTube. And you see these massive choirs, different cultures, different ages, different abilities. You belong, but you don't have to fit in. I looked at that. Um, Weight Watchers. Anyone here done Weight No, let's not do that. Not <laughs> and... Uh, you know, again, it happens in the grassroots of communities. Suddenly something spreads where people don't feel judged, that actually they feel there's people there that are going to listen to them. And I was like, what would it look like to start a movement that does that around mental and emotional health with the church at the heart of it? And so we wrote a 12-week wellbeing program um, looking at some of the biggest issues of our time. We wrote it in learning styles. And, uh, and we started training people. We did pilots. And uh, I think this map will show you um, where we started to work and, you know, churches are going, oh, this is great. We're going to run this in a homeless shelter. Um, and so they started in homeless shelters. Um, people were running it in schools, uh, people were running it in prisons, people were running it in their homes, in coffee shops. Uh, in Scotland, one person was thinking of running it in a hairdresser's, and which I think is brilliant because I think hairdressers are half therapists, half hairdressers, right? When I used to live in Peckham, um, there used to be a saying, I'm going therapy, which meant I'm going hairdressers. And, uh, you know, um, so they're going to shut the hairdressers and because the, the person who runs it says what people do is talk about mental health or their kids' mental health all the time. Um, and, uh, and then COVID hit and I'm like, that's it, we're doomed. <laughs> and, uh, and my friend said, I'm not sure we're doomed, Patrick. I think we could put the training online. People could do it online. They could do it on Zoom. Um, they might even be able to do it as a support of, you know, when we were allowed to meet in groups of six. And, uh, and, and we did. And in a year, we grew by 455%. And uh, this is where Kintsugi works today. And it's literally gone all over. Uh, 10,000 people, 400 churches, 1,500 leaders. And, you know, some of the stories are just incredible. People going, I wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for my Kintsugi group. And I think part of it is, yes, you get self-management tools. Yes, you get, um, you know, really good ideas of how to care for your mental health. But I think a lot of it is actually going, I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one. And uh, I was watching um, Mr. Bates versus the post office. I don't know if anyone's seen that on ITV. Um, and it's obviously about the, the scandal that's been going on and uh, that these postmasters have uh, uh, been basically been told that they owe um, the, the post office lots and lots of money. And it was a glitch in the computer system. And, but what happened was they would ring, ring the helpline up. And when they ring the helpline up going, I don't understand, it says I'm owing all this money. And, and yet I know, I know that I've checked every single penny and they were being made to pay back 20,000 and 30,000 and 40,000. And these were just ordinary folk just trying to make a living. And of course, what happened was people became suicidal. People took their own lives and people lost their houses and everything. But what really got me about the program is at the end, just eight or nine of them gathered in this community hall. And, uh, and one of the guys that gathered them basically said, when you rung up the helpline, did they say you're the only one who is struggling? And they went, yeah, that's exactly what they said that you're the only one that's having a problem. And they said that to hundreds of people. But when those people who thought they were only ones realized that they weren't, everything changed. And you know what? The, basically the guy goes, you've been told you're the only one. Just so you know, you will never be the only one ever again. 
And that's the message of community, right? And that's what Elijah needed. I said to God, you know what? If the next big move of your spirit comes in some massive place in America with a massive warehouse and a massive band and God TV come and beam it all around the world and we call it revival, I think I might just quit. <laughs> but you know what? If it comes in small groups in coffee shops and prisons and brothels and universities and schools and led by people who are not like big and ego and famous, but by humble and fragile and courageous and I'm up for a move of God like that. And that's what we're desperate to see. I want to say, you know, it's interesting um, writing a book called Brighter Days is you can't write a book called Brighter Days without admitting there's been dark days. And there are lots of dark days for people out there at the moment, aren't there? You know, I've had to sit on the front row of funeral services of young kids who've been murdered um, due to knife crime and had to deal with the, the parents and try to support them. You know, I've uh, tried to help people who've been abused and have tried to put their lives back together, which is really difficult. Uh, victims of domestic violence in this country you are never a hundred yards away from a domestic violence case that is crazy that is absolutely crazy the police call it the biggest pandemic no one wants to talk about um poverty rates um our own mental health journeys but you know this is the thing despite all the rubbish i still think the human spirit is incredible I still think it's kind, it's resilient. There are amazing acts of love, kindness, justice. Everyone's made in the image of God, right? And sometimes it's spotting what God's doing and joining in. It's about saying brighter days to the teenager, self-harming in their bedroom every night. I want to say there can be brighter days to the wife who's getting beaten up by her husband. I want to say there can be brighter days to the kid riddled with anxiety so they can't be themselves. To the person who thinks God is a judge who couldn't possibly understand where they're at. I want to say it to the man who, because he's a man, keeps his feelings under wraps. We want to kick the darkness and bleed in the light. There's a saying in here, it's a Chinese proverb, which I absolutely love, which says it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. And I firmly believe that as we're faced with all this stuff going on. And so one of the challenges that we're doing at the moment in Kintsugi Hope is um, we're looking to take the message of Brighter Days outside of the Christian bubble. So, you know, the Christian bubble is an interesting place to be. We have our own worship music. We have our own books. We have our own, um, we even have our own aerobics videos. <laughs> we can do, you could do aerobics to shine Jesus shine these days. It's fantastic. Um, it's this Christian bubble that we spend so much time in. And I'm like, but what would it be like to actually, for people like me, not just to speak in church, but to speak into the education sphere and uh, maybe to go and speak into businesses, uh, into uh, other places like universities and media and the NHS and arts and police and politics and hospitality industry. And people are like, well, how on earth are you going to go to all these places and speak? And I go, well, the reality is, you know what? There are Christians in every single one of these places. And so often the Christians have just been embarrassed to invite people in to come and speak. But it's been incredible. I started doing this a couple of months ago and we've been invited into education. Um, so I've been going and doing staff training for teachers. So I get teachers, 100 teachers together in a school and do some well-being training and resilience training and, and talking about what, how they can thrive in adversity. And we've been going into businesses and doing their staff away days and looking at their culture within their business so it can be more compassionate and understanding. Um, Lincoln County Council said, would you come and speak to 70 members of our exec team? So I had 70 members of the top uh, guys in Lincoln Council. And, uh, and, and I think things are starting to happen. It's not easy. It's not always, um, you know, uh, when you speak to a Christian crowd, often they're a lot nicer than sometimes, the, you know, oh, my, I've got to hear about well-being now. Great. <laughs> and but actually things start to happen. And uh, so I would ask you to pray for us. If you're in business, if you're in education, if you're in one of these spheres and you'd love us to visit, then please come and chat to me at the end. When I was writing, I'm going to finish with this. When I was writing um, this book and uh, there was a song that came out called Brighter Days by a singer called Emily Sunday. And it didn't do that great. It was all right. It, it was written during the pandemic. And uh, but then um, right towards you know, the end was it last year, the King's Coronation concert happened. 
And, uh, and what they wanted to do is they wanted to find a song that they thought would epitomize what this nation needs to hear at the moment. And they wanted to do it in a completely different way. So at the King's Coronation concert, they basically had the top performers from around the world come. They had the Royal Ballet, the Royal Opera House, the Royal College of Music, the Royal College of Arts. Every performance was spectacular. You know, they had a mega stars come over from the States like Lionel Richie and Kate Perry and not so much mega stars like Take That. And then they decided that in the middle of this particular concert, they wanted to do a community choir. And so they went around the whole country and they just found ordinary folk. So they found farmers from Northern Ireland, NHS workers in Hull, London firefighters, uh, cab drivers, a Welsh male voice choir, a Yorkshire only female South Asian choir, Gaelic singers from Scotland and uh, the Western Isles, uh, a BSL sign language choir, refugee choir, an RM lifeguard choir. And they put them all together and smack bang in the middle of the concert. 300 people stand up and they sing a song called Brighter Days. Everyone starts texting me. <laughs> and uh, But what was beautiful about it was a number of things. One is they didn't all wear the same clothes like many choirs did. They kept, you belong, but you don't have to fit in. The other thing I loved about it is towards the end, all of them started doing sign language. And I always feel like, you know, when um, God comes back, there'll be a time when the marginalised take centre stage. And sometimes people who've uh, been struggling with their hearing have always been just put off to the side. We've got a little interpreter over there, if you're lucky. And suddenly everyone was joining in. And it was a beautiful moment. And there was a line in the song which basically says this, I'll tell you something, it's not all for nothing. And, uh, and I wanted to encourage you guys that whatever you've been through, and I'm guessing because we're a bunch of human beings here, that we've all been through stuff. And we've all struggled with different stuff, but it isn't all for nothing. Nothing is wasted. And if you're in that situation like Elijah, then actually maybe treat yourself with a bit of compassion. Maybe realize that you're not the only one. And uh, the journey may have been too much for you, just like it was for Elijah. But there is hope because it's better to light a candle than curse the darkness. Doing that, that's fantastic. Let me pray for you guys, and uh, and uh, yeah, do come and chat to us afterwards if you want to. Um, yeah, Father God, thank you for every single person in this room, Father. And I guess we can all relate to that, the roller coaster of life, and uh, and Lord, we can often relate to how that can produce so much anxiety for all of us, Lord. But I thank you that you're not removed from that, that you are with us, and that. Lord, that when we come to you with our cries, you don't get cross of us for struggling, but actually you show us a huge amount of compassion. And I pray, Lord, for every single person here that they would know that they're loved, that they're special, that they're made in the image of God, and there's no one like them. And, Father, that they would just know that, that sense of your gentle presence with them, Lord God. And I thank you in your kingdom, Lord. I thank you that nothing is wasted, that, that somehow that you put the brokenness of our lives back together. And it's not that we're glad that we've been through tough stuff, but Father, we do recognize that you do take those things and you do something beautiful with it, Lord. So do something beautiful in our lives, we pray, Lord God. And, uh, and Lord, I pray for everyone here that they would know that whatever they go through, whatever their emotion is, whatever the situation they're facing, that they are not on their own, that they have a loving community here, but also a loving community that's wider, that, that is, is there for them, Lord Jesus, that they have to never do anything on their own. And I thank you, Lord, that when we became Christians, that was the last choice we had to make on our own, um, because every situation now, we know that we have your gentle presence with us. And, uh, Help us to know that presence in our lives. Amen.